Bring all your failures, bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting, God so loved the world. Amen. Good morning, everyone. I can see the sunny side's much more popular this time of year. <laughs> oh, well, it's lovely to, to have you here with us today and um, trust that we're all going to be blessed. We're together in the house of the Lord. That's a good thing, hey. And think back to the time when we couldn't even meet together. And um, so we're thankful for that. Now, today, Reese, our pastors, come back from some time of leave so it'd be good to hear from Reese again and um, his t topic is entitled the heart of the matter in the code breaker series and the scripture will be mark chapter 7 verses 14 to 23 so let's commit our time to God in prayer Lord you know what each of us has been through this week whether we've felt far from you or we felt close to you or we feel there are things that we've done or said that we regret and Lord we just want to bring ourselves before you now because we know we come not in the strength or the righteousness of what we've done or said but by the blood of Jesus that Lord if we come in the need of healing and restoration, Lord, we know that Jesus has made that way for us. So, Lord, just as we bow before you now, let our hearts be open to you and to ourselves, that we can be honest about how it is with our soul. And we pray, Lord, that you'll meet us where we are and take us on closer into you for your name's sake. Amen. I'm going to um, read some verses from Psalm 19. The first half of this psalm talks about the heavens and the way it proclaims God's goodness to all who can see it. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech, they use no words, no sound is heard from them, yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the end of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoices to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. And uh, we're very glad of the warmth of the sun and a winter morning. At other times we'd rather have a little less of it, but with those words in our mind, let's think of God's love for his world. God so loved the world. Goodness, find what you're looking for. 
We did. Welcome. It sounds like this lot up here have warmed up and this lot down here haven't yet. <laughs> we'll give you time. I'm not doing star jumps. <laughs> welcome to Mark and Janet's friends. Welcome. Thanks for bringing the cold with you. We've got a few birthdays this week. Sharon Brady, happy birthday for Wednesday. Mm. Robin, happy birthday for Thursday. <laughs> Janet, happy birthday for Friday. <laughs> Some family news. Jen's um, mum passed away during the week, so we've got that funeral on this week coming. Our condolences. So if my, bread, if my head's not quite with it, you'll understand why. Um, Tuesday, what's on this week? We've got the Connect Group, we've got Deacon's Meeting. Wednesday, we've got Ladies KYB and the Ladies Bible Study. Thursday, we've got the ASD Support Group. Friday, the Connect Group. Saturday, if you're a lady, you're invited to morning tea. Don't forget to RSVP for that. That'll be a good time of fellowship and a little bit of planning for the year for you. What's coming up? Next Saturday, the ladies' morning tea. Don't forget. And then the week after, the men's are having their breakfast. And then on the 31st, we've got Alpha Introduction and Training um, Lunch. So there'll be, if you're online, you've got an invite in the, um, on your emails. Uh, and you should have some copies of the invite at the front there. You're invited to come along and share in that time. 
Let's spend some time in prayer. Father, you are God, and we praise you for that. No matter how we're feeling, what we're going through, you are still God. And in all things we're going through, we praise your name. We thank you for being with us day to day. Lord, we give back to you a little bit of what you have given to us in terms of our tithes and offerings. We thank you for the blessings that you have given us. And you are a generous God and we are learning to be generous people. So Lord, accept the gifts that we give, either online or, or in the box at the front of the church. We give it with grateful hearts. And Lord, some of us are going through difficult times at the moment. We've got a number of family who are not well. So we think of Carol, we think of Lofty, we think of Jack, we think of Marilyn, we think of Bev, we think of Judy, we think of Marcus, we think of Anne, we think of Diane. Lord, you know their individual circumstances. You know what they're going through today. So Lord, today we lift them up to you. Be enough for them today, we pray. And Lord, for Jen and her family, we lift them up to you too. Lord, thank you that we can share as a family our good times and our sad times. We pray that as we continue to meet in your name this morning, that you be glorified and that we all be blessed in our relationships one with another and with you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Um, a little bit of happy family news is that uh, Denise and Graham are looking forward to their, um, their far-flung family coming back. And, uh, yeah, so they haven't seen them for a couple of years. Their son and daughter-in-law and the three grandsons. So they're just hoping... Two grandsons? Three. Didn't I say three? Oh, three years. Okay, three years. <laughs> And um, so they're really looking forward to that and uh, praying that they'll arrive safely and all the details will fall into, into place for the next visit. Got a few more verses for you from Psalm 19. This follows on from the description of God's glory revealed in creation. And it's talking about the law of the Lord. And that's not just the rights and the wrongs and the do's and the don'ts, but it's the heart of God. It's the heart of who he is and how he wants his people to be. And those of us who open our hearts to what God says experience great joy and peace. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May the words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So we're asking in the next... Um, Song, we're asking.
the Lord to open our eyes to all that he is and all that he has for us and to his holiness. And um, it can be very confronting when we are confronted with the holiness of God. Like um, Peter said to Jesus when suddenly their boat was full of fish and there hadn't been a fish to be seen all night. Lord, go away from me. I'm a sinful man. Because he was aware that he was in the presence of holiness. And sometimes we just don't, don't want to get too close to holiness because it shows up what's lacking in ourselves. But let's open our hearts, open our eyes to let the loving kindness of God touch us today. We're going to sing, Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. I want to see you.
open the eyes of my heart. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see. says like the law of the Lord is like gold like pure gold and in this song we're asking the Lord to refine our hearts to be as gold and precious silver We, uh, we had the privilege of, of celebrating Esther and Jack's wedding out at Gordon Country, um, a significant and a, a wonderful day, um, never been more proud. Well, enough of all that, back into Codebreaker. Now, there will be no Codebreaker 31.2. In actual fact, I was thinking I might actually flick the rest of the series over to Tim. He did such a good job a couple of weeks ago. I was very, very proud as I listened to my brother speaking of the challenges and difficulties of Mark chapter 7. What a tough chapter. Goodness me, pots and pans and ceremonial washing and corban and, and your, your 
with your lips you worship me, but your hearts are far removed. Oh, wow. Tough stuff. But well done, mate. Really, uh, really appreciated the way that, and I'll be referring to a story that you, you told at the end that for me was really significant about inclusion and the power of it and the power of exclusion and how that actually works. Because that's really what this story is about, inclusion and exclusion. Um, I was once part of a quite an exclusive Christian ministry. It took me quite some time to become accepted as a member. And, uh, but then as I took in my full status as a member of this, this quite exclusive ministry, um, the first meeting I went to, um, the, the leader of that group, was saying, look, you know, we need to put in place a new executive committee and I want this person to be the deputy and I want this other person uh, to do the secretarial work and da, 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 and, and sort of mapped it all out and said to the, the members present, what do you think? And everyone said, oh, yeah, that sounds good, that sounds good, that sounds good. Yeah. And when you come into a situation as a pastor, it carries with it credentials and weight and you need to be really careful about how you kind of express your opinions. And I, and I said, well, if, if you're actually asking me my opinion, I've, I, I, I know these people, uh, some of them part of my church. I said, the, the deputy leader's role is a pastoral position. And, and the person that you're suggesting to put into that role would be functioning outside of their gifts, outside of their experience. They, they are not pastoral type people. Um, that they, they, they could do a management job, but not a pastoral job. I said, so if, if you want to have these people in your executive, that's great. I said, but maybe you could assign this person the job of managing these factors. And this person who, who hasn't proven herself as a part of this group yet, or as a part of the ministry as a member, I said, she has administrative capacity, but maybe alongside of this other person doing some of that management stuff, she could provide the secretarial support so you can have your cake and eat it too. And all of the other members at the table said, he's right, he's right, he's right. I didn't want to be right. He just asked my opinion. And, and the next, next minute... So who is leading this group now anyway? We, don't you even go there, sport. But then for the next number of years, I had the monkey on my back. And it didn't seem to matter where I went. And everywhere I went in my itinerant ministry, I was, and I, I was very aware I was an ambassador for this particular ministry in the various elements. And simply because I couldn't go out on a Friday night between 8 o'clock and midnight, to, to their works, um, I was copping it in the neck all the time. And it's quite fascinating what happens when, when people are between a rock and a hard place and feeling intimidated. That um, when, when we feel under, under threat, part of the human condition to overcome is the tendency to want to protect our ground. And that's very much the the context that Mark is writing into with this group of fledgling believers in the north of Palestine, where you've got Trajan and his armies coming down from the north, you've got the zealots coming up from the south, and this group are under intense pressure, and they would have been trying to work out the questions about who is in and who is out, and what does it mean to belong. So that's the backdrop that's in, that we have to hold this as our context. Because the bottom line and what I've learned is that, that without thoughtful self-reflection, we will project and transfer our insecurities, our value judgments, our preferences, our prejudices, both onto the scriptures and ultimately onto others to validate ourselves in those things that we ourselves are insecure about. 
We read the Bible and love according to what we love and need, not necessarily what the other person loves and needs. It's as Anais Nin once said that we don't see things as they are. We see things as we are. And that's what Jesus is addressing here. So let's have a look at Mark 7, 14 and 23. If you have your Bibles, otherwise it'll be up on the screen, your Bibles or your device. Um, so, verse 14. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it's what comes out of a person that defiles them. That's verse 15. Notice verse 16. Missing. Anyway, we'll come back to that. Verse 17. After he'd left the crowd and entered a house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Are you so dull? He didn't mince his words. Uh, He asked, Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach, and then out of the body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. He went on, what comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it's it's from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality Theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. It's quite a vice list, isn't it? We're going to have a bit of a gander at that a little later. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. But Jesus identifies the heart. It's the heart of the matter. This This is the center of it all. You see, a a difficulty of Mark 7, unless we have an insider's view of a world that's dominated by the Jewish temple politic, the nuances that influence the story escape us and we can miss the point. So Mark's aware of that. And this group, as I said, the north of Palestine, not familiar with Jerusalem or the temple. So he explains to his original readers in the message Tim spoke of a couple of weeks ago so well about the ritual of washing hands, pots and pans, korban. He, he gave Tim, fantastic, mate, I've got to say. Sorry, don't mean to embarrass you, but it was really good. <laughs> um, But now Mark addresses the controversy about the interpretation and practice of Judaism by Jesus and his followers. So Mark's readers, the original readers, they need some sort of explanation around this. So when it comes to the clean and the unclean, we actually have to understand it's a weighty, it's a matter of some weightiness in their world. Some of the most famous martyr stories in Jesus' world were people who'd been tortured, killed for refusing to eat certain unclean foods, and of course, in particular, pork. And so Jesus understands a deep truth about the way humans are, which meant that for his kingdom message, he had to take a radically different line. The message itself is difficult. He knows it's not going to go down well. I mean, you might as well try and tell Vladimir Putin and the Russian oligarchs that the Ukrainians are equal and they need to honour their right to free determination. How do you reckon that's going to go? Yeah. No. And so this... Neither is a message that is going to be heard a little bit like my moment that was not heard, except by the other members. And that's why Jesus used parables. I wish I was a quicker thinker on my feet to be able to pluck a parable out and go, there you go. 
Here, chew this one over for a week or two. But Jesus used parables, not just on this occasion, but many others. It's the only way he could say some of the most devastating things that he had to say. You know, if you're trying to tell your world that it's seeing things the wrong way, that its heroes fought for the wrong cause, and its martyrs died in the wrong ditch, you've got to be careful about how you go about it, don't you? It's got to be cryptic. And the Pharisees had asked questions publicly that needed to be answered publicly. But Jesus wasn't about to argue scriptures with them in public or hand them a publicity victory. He expected his disciples to get the point, yet they're slow on the uptake again. No different to us. They share a general puzzlement, you know, talk of what goes into you, what comes out of you. It seems to lead to some kind of dark humour that may well have found a place in, in Greek comic plays, but certainly and definitely not part of Jesus' kingdom announcement. I mean, what on earth could he have meant? So, a little bit like the parable of the sower in chapter 4, it's only when where Jesus was talking about the nature of the kingdom, it was only when they got back in private that he explains the meaning of this. It's not about the physical body, but the heart. That traditional moral that traditional moral center of a person as the Hebrews viewed a person. That's the issue. The heart is the heart of the matter, and the pun really is intended. (laughs) He hadn't been talking about the physical things that come out of a person. They, like food, are quite irrelevant for the purposes of purity. Jesus is talking about what comes out of the heart. Those things that the purity laws are inadequate to address. And Jesus points to the very real need for for humans to have a deeper purity, a purity of motive. And eating will not affect that. So those who get stuck on regulations about food or behavior, they won't ever progress to the real point. Of this story. In fact, quite literally, they'll miss the point. Because focusing on outward purity and behavior avoids the, the much deeper heart challenge of the gospel, which is all about the heart. The heart is the center of our convictions, it influences our decisions, it drives all that we become. And we need to understand. Jesus' world to get to the bottom of what he's saying because at this point, so many people get thrown off track. See, popular religion and philosophy from the time of Plato suggests that the physical world is bad, you, and the spiritual world is good. The, the, the dualism, that which is spiritual is good, that which is physical is bad. But because we can fit that sort of thinking inside our existing view of things, we may expect Jesus to say those sorts of things too. And so this passage doesn't cause us too much concern or disturb us. But friends, we'd be, at that point, we'd be wrong. This passage should disturb us. Jesus is specifically not saying that external and physical things are irrelevant or bad and that internal spiritual things are good, he is saying if we get in touch with our deepest feelings and longings, if we're able to listen to what our hearts are truly telling us, that's where we'll find our real identity. And he's insisting that 
good and bad external and physical actions stem from internal and spiritual sources. The poison wells of human motivation are where the, the problems really are. And the purity laws, they point to it, but they're absolutely inadequate at addressing it. So we can't isolate one part of our human makeup and blame it for evil. But neither does Jesus suggest getting in touch with our truest feelings will lead us to the right track either. I mean, what if those feelings that most truly express who we currently are turned out to be included in Jesus' list where he alludes to, in part to the prophet Hosea's denouncement of public crime in Israel, Hosea 4 and 2. You see, Jesus isn't just establishing another vice list. I mean, remember who Hosea was. I had a, a massive moment around, like Jesus could have gone to Deuteronomy. He could have gone to Leviticus. He could have gone to Jeremiah, Ezekiel. He could have gone anywhere. Why did he go to Hosea? What is it about Hosea that Jesus would go to? What was the difference? Well, I think part of it's in Hosea's name. His name means salvation. And the other part of it's about his ministry, which was about the restoration of relationship of Israel with their God. It wasn't about behavior. It was about the restoration of relationship. Now, I know it's a devotional thought, but boy, oh boy, it's a really big devotional thought in the context of this message. You see, truth of the matter is, if there's evil, it infects the whole, and it can't simply be papered over with some external observances. Jesus in this story, is redrawing the lines of group identity. Those who are in are those who belong to God. It's a radical proposition. You see, they would see they belong to God, so they're in. You see the difference? <laughs> There's a huge difference here. The radical proposition for a first century Jew. You know, actually, uh, there, was, there was a Russian Eastern Orthodox priest, St. Seraphim of Sarov, uh, 1754, 1883. He was one of their most venerated saints. And surely the Russians could deal with a deal of his wisdom today, couldn't they? I'd have thought. But he had this to say. Why do we judge our neighbours? Because we're not trying to get to know ourselves. Someone busy trying to understand himself. has no time to notice the shortcomings of others. Judge yourself and you'll stop judging others. I thought that was really profound. It's too easy to turn the spotlight like to others rather than actually looking at what's going on within here. But when we, when we actually turn the spotlight within, that's where we find our relationship with God. And I remember in John 21, when Peter turned around to Jesus after that, you know, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? You know, feed my lambs, feed my lambs. And, um, and Peter turns around and points to John and says, what about him? And Jesus said, what about him? You follow me. <laughs> It's pretty straightforward, isn't it? So what's at stake between Jesus' kingdom agenda and the Pharisees? Well, as we've learned through the Codebreaker series, and the message has been consistent for the last 18 months, two years as we've looked at this series, we've considered purity, debt and law observance and regulations of the society and a culture that's dominated by honour and shame. And, it's identified, and we've identified its boundaries. 
that if that society feels under threat, it will reinforce its purity codes as a way of insisting to itself and to anyone else who would notice that this is what the way it really should be. And the lesson is obvious. The Jews in the Middle East had for centuries been surrounded and infiltrated by paganism, both as a cultural force and as military might. What's more natural than to reinforce the purity codes, which said in powerful language of cultural symbols, we're Jews, we're different, we don't live like you do. This story is about the challenge to religion's role in preserving difference, not uttering, ushering in the kingdom of God. You see, I have the same problem with the push, the, the supposed anti-discrimination documents that have been pushed, tried to push through government. I have the same problem. It's the Christians trying to wall themselves in and strengthen their purity codes. I've got to tell you, It's the wrong focus. We need to be focusing on the ushering in of the kingdom of God. And it's a different focus. One is an external focus. The other is an internal focus. And that's what Jesus is bringing to us today. So what if the kingdom of God means God's people throwing open the doors to all, to all. How many is all? All. God's kingdom doesn't have an offshore processing detention center where people are vetted. That is not the picture here. God's kingdom has a people who are generous, unabashed, bold, who will throw open the doors of his kingdom to all. See, God desires that none would perish. And what would happen to the purity code symbolic then? Surely it would collapse. And how the light of the kingdom would shine. And that's what this story is about. The collapse of the boundaries that define the in v the out, the honour v the shame. Replaced by self-examination of heart attitudes and self-discovery of our true child of Godness that leads to the judging of ourselves, not others. Radical acceptance, inclusion, freeing others from our judgments as we trust ourselves and others to God. And I pointed out earlier It's interesting to note the NIV and a number of other contemporary translations omit chapter 7 and verse 16. Are you curious to know what it is? Because it actually uh, appears a little bit earlier in chapter 4. Here it is. If anyone has ears, let them hear. I saw a meme on Facebook last week, a husband and wife walking away from the church and The bloke was talking to his wife saying, gee, the the preacher was really on point this morning. That was a great message for the bloke who was three rows down. (laughs) This isn't a message to hear for somebody else. This is a message for each of us to hear for ourselves. But I just find it, isn't it curious that that particular, it's in the Greek, but it's been omitted. So, As we reflect a little this morning, I think one of the things we need to consider, what are some of the things that sign our difference to the people around us? What are some of those things that sign? 
who we accept, who we bring to the table, how we love, who we include. Uh, I think it's the, that little sermon out of chocolate. You know, we define ourselves by what we are for rather than what we are against. But what are the things that sign our difference? Is it what we don't do? Or is it what we do? So of those things that sign our difference, how many of them are actually expressions of God's kingdom, of justice, mercy, compassion, loving kindness and faithfulness. Because sometimes we'll draw a boundary or a line in the sand and it's got nothing to do with any of those things. The next thing to consider, how is your heart? Do you know yourself? Or shift the focus to others? Do you have ears to hear? Or are you suffering from tone deafness? Hearing loss, Jackie would say to me. You know, I've been on the Harley for too long and you get the wind in the ear between the open face helmet and your head and it's like you've got crickets going in your ears all the time. But what about the ears and the eyes of your heart? Tim, I was reflecting on your message about the playing with the robots, the robots playing and the human agent playing and the angst and anxiety. Actually, that's about next Sunday's message. But it really plays into this as well. When the robots were playing with the human, the, everyone was happy. Well, the robots didn't really mind, but the humans didn't mind either. But the minute the robots started to play with each other, up came the anxiety, up came the angst, up came the dissatisfaction. It's so true. There, there's something to be said for the privilege of inclusion. And for us as the people of God to throw wide open the doors of inclusion. Next week's story is very much a, a very practical illustration of Jesus practicing what he preaches, even though he didn't want to. It's quite fascinating. Come back next week, we'll find out some more together. But, you know, I, I, I hope that this is a helpful reflection as we start to think into the complexities that are going to be visited upon us over the next three to five years as we grow, as our region grows, as more people come in, we will have a choice to either close ourselves down and protect the centre of what we think we have or throw our arms open and dare to dream God dream. That's the choice that's upon us. I hope this is helpful for us. Let's pray together. His Father, Jesus found very creative ways to speak difficult truth, hard truth, to cause people to reflect, to really expose the heart of the matter. And Father, in, in our inadequate ways, we simply want to follow the Master to be a people in your hands who throw open the doors of the kingdom of God wide. We're grateful that you don't have a detention centre to vet people's fitness to come in or out, but rather that your acceptance of us is unconditional. Your acceptance of us in your faithfulness is secure in your great love as you bring us to yourself 
in Jesus. And we're grateful for the way that you love us and that you love us so much to bring transformation to us, that you love us as we are, and yet you love us that we can be like Jesus in all of our ways. So continue the work of your spirit among us, we pray, that we can be a people. We can be a people to the praise of the glory of your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. I've had some interesting conversations with uh, many people over the time of, of being here about my attitude towards the communion table. And uh, I, I don't have a, a, a highly austere, a man ought or a woman ought to examine themselves rigorously before they come to the table uh, as if if we're... If we're not worthy, that we can't participate. In actual fact, it's when we feel we are at our unworthiness, worst, we need the table. We need the table to remind us of our acceptance with God. It's fascinating. And, and for the, when, when the scripture exhorts that, a person ought to examine themselves, it's not about whether or not they've driven five kilometres an hour over the speed limit, had an argument with their wife or husband on their way to church, maybe taken the wooden spoon to the baby, you know, to put the hand of correction on the seat of learning, you know. And I know that that's seen as assault these days, and I've seen people... It's amazing. But it's not about those that vice list of externals. It's about unity. The whole Corinthian catastrophe from chapter 1 all the way through, it was a community of, of division. I follow Apollos. I follow Paul. I follow Kephas. And Paul says, yeah, but I follow Jesus. And, and it's the examination to say, are you following Jesus or are you following a faction? Are you following a purity code? Are you following a something or other apart from Jesus? Is Jesus defining our all in all? Again, Paul, even in his, his articulation of the communion table, he is actually saying this too is a matter of heart. I have and I work with an open communion table. You don't have to be a member of the church. You don't even have to be a regular attender. And you know something? You don't even have to be a Christian. The table is here to speak of a life that was given in death, that we might live. That's what this table is about. It is a table for all, and I am not going to put any barriers for any man, woman, or child to come to this table and enjoy the Lord's richest of fare. If you're not yet a Christian, I say to you, this too is for you. Participate with us. There's no mystery in it. But let these elements speak to you of, of a, a body broken, of bloodshed, to, to bring life. If you think you're not worthy, I say join the queue behind me. Because there's not one part of me that is worthy, if that's what it took. But because of this table, he brings me and you to himself. The terms, the body that was broken, the blood that was shed, that we might have life.
so if you're a member of the church, not a member of the church, none of any of that matters. But this morning, we can actually put a little bit of an exclamation point on the table today as a place of family business. Because finally, we can get to celebrate Robin Roylands coming in as a member of our church. Robin, please come. That's okay. Gwen and Tony, you might like to come as well as our elders and Tim. Just to gather around Robin. We've been trying to get this sort of happening all this year. <laughs> oh, no, look, you know, and we've been busy and there's been things that have been happening. And, oh, and yeah, look, you know, Robin's had a heart attack. And, and Gwen, could I ask you, please, could you pray for, for Robin? I'll just get us a, a mic for you. Oh, thanks, Tony. Oh, that's a good plan. Uh, the, and, and I think, why I say an exclamation point? Because the table is family business. It speaks to us. It's a table with the family story. And it's the basis of the unity that bring us together, that bring us together as, it, it's not about external observance, but it's about internal transformation and agreeing with what God has done. So Gwen, if you could lead us in prayer, please. Father God, I just want to thank you so much for Robin. I thank you for her love for you. I thank you for her faithfulness. I thank you for all the ways you've led her. And I thank you for this moment when we can actually officially say she's part of our body here at Meribah. So God, I'm just praying that you'll bless her and bless us in our fellowship together. Lord, I pray that as we journey together, we'll learn from each other. We'll love each other, not judging each other, but we will just learn from each other and know that, God, you have so much wonderful things for us in the future as we journey together. So bless Robin, I pray now, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Can we have a round of acclamation, please? Thank you. Thank you. Okie dokie, thank you very much. And as stewards this morning, if I could invite you please, thanks Ross and June, thank you, to come and we'll, we'll now, we'll pray together and, and we'll get Ross and June to, to distribute these elements. Ross, could you lead us in a prayer please? Our Father, we're so thankful that your loving kindness and your grace has been extended to us through the sacrifice that our Lord has made. And as we take the symbols, Father, and as we think about our heart condition and, and our relationship with you, may we appreciate the price that was paid to buy us back into your family. Our God, we are so indebted, we are so privileged, we are people who have been privileged beyond beyond compare. And Heavenly Father, we just honour you and thank you for that. We bow our knee to our Lord Jesus Christ and thank you now for the mercy that's been shown us and for the symbols that we can have to show our relationship through him to you and our worship of you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks.
heard me say before, there are times where I find the elements perhaps a little bit underwhelming. Um, but you know something? I think it's probably just as well that they are because the meaning of what they stand for is overwhelming. And, and so we, we take the bread, remembering the body that was broken for us, And I continue to look at the words on the front of our communion table until he come, that remembering that Jesus said he would not take another drop until he returned, that he is coming. And then we will celebrate together with the cup of the kingdom. So it's probably just as well we have these small remembrances in, so that on that day, on that day, we can celebrate together until he comes. Father, we appreciate, oh, look, words just seem so inadequate to, to express to you the depth of, of gratitude in our hearts for your grace, your mercy, and your love, that you set right what was wrong by removing what was wrong to restore what was right, and that through a life that we didn't live and a death that we didn't die that we can trust for our eternal destiny and so we say thank you for your goodness and your grace because in in every way Jesus did more than that which was required to bring us back into relationship with you and this really is the heart of the matter this really is the heart of the matter we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Celia, could you and the team sing us out, please? Jesus paid it all. All the him I owe. Sin has left its crimson stain. He's washed me white as snow.
this morning and to our online family. It's been great to have you with us. Trust that this morning has been an encouragement to you. We'd welcome you to join us for morning tea afterwards and um, really pray and trust that we might keep the main thing the main thing and allow the heart of the matter to really shape us as we journey forward. Thank you.